Um, well, we're really pleased to have David and Dee. David is one of the Florida Stop Birders, a lifelong resident of Central Florida, where he spent over 25 years leading tours, both through his previous job as a ranger at the Sebastian Buffer Preserve and at festivals, including Space Coast and the Big O Birding Festival and North Shore. David holds many American Birding Association, ABA records, and he's a county lister, and maybe he'll mention some of that tonight. And he's a birding guy through his own company, Birding with David Simpson, that you can look up online. And Dee Simpson is a longtime birder, Florida master naturalist, certified interpretive guide, and a former Space Coast Audubon board member. And with David, she's developed many classes that they present at festivals and to the general public. So thank you for coming, Dee and David. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome to Birding Hotspots of Indian River County. I grew up in Brevard County, just north of here. And now Indian River is my new adopted home county for the last 17 years. Still do a lot of birding in both places, but today we're going to highlight some of the some of the better spots and some of the species that you might see in those areas and tell you a little bit about birding some of the locations and basically i'm just going to ramble on about birds so those of you who know me well that will be familiar those of you who don't know me it might be new but um d is the technical part and the creative part of the business so she's the one that set this presentation up and she's going to share with you some of her her poetry from her blog, D at 8 a.m. You'll see on some of the slides out there. Um, she has a daily blog that posts at eight o'clock every morning about some sort of natural phenomenon, a bird, a plant, a spider or something like that. And she'll research it, come up with a little brine that helps you learn a little bit about it and remember it. Um, so we'll see some of those throughout. And uh, basically, hopefully you'll come away learning, knowing a little bit more about any River County and hopefully want to come over and visit us over here and see some of our great birding spots. So, you want to say anything? No, thank okay. you. All right. All right. So, let me move on. To, okay. So, Sebastian Inlet actually straddles Indian River and Brevard County. So, um, it's one of the best birding hotspots in our area. Obviously, it's an inlet. It attracts a lot of coastal birds there. When they dug the inlet out, they dug it several times before it finally stuck. It kept sanding back in, um, filling back in with sand. Um, I think 1921 was the last time that it was able to, that they were able to get it dug out and, and it kept, has been kept out since then. Um, and big change that it created to this Indian River Lagoon system was now there was fresh, or salt water rather, coming in and out on a regular basis in the tides and that changed the Indian River Lagoon from a, um, mostly freshwater system to a brackish system and, and helped to turn it into one of the best, one of the most biodiverse um, estuaries in the world because of that, the, the combination of that, that mixing of the freshwater and saltwater. And also we happen to be in an area that is a mix of temperate and tropical species of plants and animals and birds. So that confluence has created a tremendous diversity. And, Sebastian Inlet State Park is a great spot. Um, they were nice enough to create a little tidal pool um, on the north side of Sebastian Inlet, which is where we mostly go to see shorebirds like the black skimmer we have featured here. Um, skimmers really like the inlet for some reason. You might see three or 400 of them there at a time, at times in there. Um, they made it for swimmers, I'm sure, but, um, but the birds certainly love it too. So move on to. And one of the things that we'll see, this is some of the poetry I told you about here, about the brown pelican. Dee has actually done a couple of videos for, um, for Tampa Audubon uh, about pelicans and the hazards of feeding them. We've got this picture. Where did you get the picture from? This was actually at, at um, Sebastian Inlet oh, as well. So Sebastian Inlet, okay. So you might see this at Sebastian Inlet. So. Yeah, he's actually, for those of you not familiar with pelicans, he's actually just yawning. And if you look at, you can see like, He's got that big, huge beak, but it, the opening to his throat is actually very tiny, which is why you shouldn't be feeding big carcasses and stuff to pelicans because they do get caught. They don't go past the throat. Yeah, good. <clears throat> great big mouth, tiny little throat. Doesn't yeah. work too well for swallowing 
big fish but but the pelican sit out there is a great place if you're into photography it's a great place for taking pictures of pelicans and cormorants that sit on the rocks out there along the, the edge of the inlet um i was out there playing with my uh, new phone scope device several years back and i was standing there in a tidal pool i was using the bluetooth um, I had the phone set up on the scope there. I'm watching the pelicans and taking pictures, just boring little pelicans and cormorants, but I'm just practicing. And floating behind the pelicans was a razor bill, um, which is a super rare bird in Florida. This was the year after the big invasion that we had back in 2012 and 13, I think. We had um, hundreds of razor bills come down here in Florida. It's never happened before, never happened since, but following year I had one in October it was just one of those things that happens when you're birding a place like Sebastian Inlet you never know what's going to pop up and so you get out there and even on a boring old day you still get to see a lot of neat birds out there but but that day I had a it was October 13th which would be early for razor bills in Cape Cod much less Florida so I don't know what in the world this thing was doing there but thankfully I had the phone scope I was able to take pictures of it and document it so people wouldn't think I was nuts um or they probably do anyways, but at least I had proof I had a razor bill. But um, so that was kind of interesting. One of the things that you'll see when you're out there at Sebastian Inlet um, sometimes. And we also, we often get the frigate birds out there. You can see a picture of a male here with a little bit of his, his pouch there. We see pretty much all male frigate birds in our area. The, the, the nearest nesting colony is down at the Dry Tortugas National Park, which is a whole other subject that we could get into. Um, but they wander quite a ways north of there. The females tend to stay closer to those breeding areas. Um, the males, both immature males and adult males will wander up into our area. We do occasionally see an adult female, but, but not very often. Usually you see the solid dark ones, which are the adult males, or you see the ones with the white head and chest, which are the immature birds. So could be immature male or female. It's hard to tell the difference. So, uh, but we, some days, you know, you'll get 30 or 40 of them hanging out there at the inlet. Sometimes you don't see any out there. Um, they just wander around. They're not nesting, so they can kind of go wherever they want to. So they follow the food sources around. So we go to the next. And we do get um, some, we get gulls out there. You can see this, these couple of herring gulls were seen at the, sitting on the moss, or the seaweed covered, covered rocks at the um, tidal pond out there. See a couple of nice different plumages showing there. Um, it's probably a second year bird below and then an adult up above with the nice pink legs and the gray back. The one down below, it has retained some of, a lot of its juvenile feathers, but some of the gray feathers are coming in of its second year or so. Gulls can be quite difficult to keep up with all the different variations. One nice thing about gulls versus um, warblers and sparrows is gulls will just sit right there, which is good and bad. It's good because you get to study them. It's also kind of bad because we get to see so many more variations and individual variations in gulls that we probably also are, exist in sparrows and warblers, but we just don't get to see it because they flip by so quickly. So. You can study and study and study and find all these crazy variations in gold plumages. It's really a lot of fun um, for some people. I, I'm I'm somewhat into that. I'm not quite that nerdy that I get into gulls, but there are people who are lyrophiles who can go really nuts with the gulls. Um, and the best place to do that around here is up in um, um, well, up near Daytona Beach, Daytona Beach, Daytona Shores. Beach Shores, Daytona Beach Shores at Frank Rendon Park. Um, well, Frank Rendon Park is a convenient place to access. The gulls will be up and down the park for miles and up and on the beach for miles in both directions out there. In the late afternoon, they come in from the landfill, they rest on the beach for a little bit, and then they fly offshore to spend the night amongst the sharks out there. So, um, and you can, there will literally be miles and miles of gulls out there and they've had a lot of neat stuff so but you can go to Sebastian Inlet you can go to other places you can go to Brevard County Landfill and study the gulls there um one of the ones that we had we had several this last winter uh, we don't see them every year at this latitude it's the Bonaparte gulls you know on the left side here um they're kind of neat because they're one of the few gulls that are smaller than laughing gulls generally laughing gulls is going to be the smallest gull you see in Florida but Bonaparte's black-headed 
little gulls. Those are all smaller, and Franklin's gulls are also smaller a little bit. But these guys are kind of neat because they 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 have a brownish or, or black head in their breeding plumage. The Bonaparte's gulls do, but we never see that down here. They molt out of it before they come down here in the fall, and then they don't molt back into it till they leave us in springtime. So we see them with this neat little black spot behind the eye and little dainty little head, and tiny little bill. They're very turn-like, the Bonaparte's gulls are. At a distance, they'll mix with Forster's turn sometimes up um, in North Florida. There's a lake up there. Um, I can't draw a blank on the name of the lake up there, but they'll come to me eventually. But, uh, but there'll be hundreds of Bonaparte's gulls and Forster's turns out there, and they'll be two or three miles away out there. And it's really hard to separate them because the Bonaparte's are so turn-like. A lot of times I've seen a Bonaparte's gull flying in and I thought it was some kind of turn at first because it's so buoyant and pointy and so different from the other gulls. Um, but they're kind of a neat looking thing. We see them sometimes around on the coastal areas generally. Now they will show up on inland lakes sometimes as well. Um, so next. And then this guy here, if you're older like me, you remember when lesser blackback gull was a, was a, hotline bird if you remember what hotlines were back when we actually had telephones and would call people when a rare bird showed up i remember going out to port canaveral up in brevard county in 1987 i don't remember the exact date but a few of us went out there because an adult lesser black that doll had shown up out there and it was really rare and interesting and exciting and um so we went out there and we saw this lady back color of it and the yellow legs and everything we we're studying it and all that um about 10 years later it wasn't unusual to see a couple dozen of them at port canaveral and now to this day you can go to the coco landfill or go to indian river lagoon or even port canaveral you might see two or three hundred of these out there so they've really invaded in the area um, initially we had a hard time separating them from the immature herring gulls we weren't used to seeing these guys versus herring gulls but one thing that I think is really neat about these guys, they're kind of crisp and, and kind of neat looking and, and their, their markings are nice and clean edged on the wings. They got the nice crisp black tail. They have a solid black bill for the most part. They're a little bit smaller, more slender than um, herring gulls. They have longer wings, which is, is shown in this where the wings are spread out like this. Um, but herring gulls are just kind of smudgy and blocky looking and just kind of unkempt, uh, more like me, I guess. Um, <laughs> but these guys are kind of dressed up like they're ready to go out in the town out here. They got that nice, crisp, neat look to them. Um, and the other thing with the spread wing like this, um, the inner primaries, which are towards the end of the wing, but not all the way out to the end of the wing, they would be have a, there'd be a big pale panel in those um, feathers on a herring gull, which this one's kind of interesting because it does have a little bit of pale edges on the primaries in there, which I thought is kind of odd. You're usually solid dark across the back, so um, that's probably just individual variation in this one. But but that's a good way if they're especially if they're flying with the wings are spread, that that little pale panel in the wing is a good mark to look for for. Um, for the um, herring gulls versus lesser blackback gulls. Um, size difference is usually good, but there's a lot of size variation in gulls and um, there can be some overlap sometimes in, in the size. Structure is, is very good usually, um, but those are getting into advanced topics that, you know, um, borderline nerd stuff. So what's next? Um, hey, David, hmm? oh. was there, is there any idea of where they're breeding from? Um, well, they came over, they followed a pattern that several other species did, like great black bat gull and black headed gull and sort of a little gull where they, they were breeding in Europe and then kind of made their way over to Iceland and, and Greenland and then eventually to the northeastern US. I don't, I haven't kept up with it. I'm not sure if lesser black bat gulls have been found nesting in North America yet. I think most of our birds are coming down from Greenland. They probably are nesting in North America somewhere. But well, there's so many remote islands out there that they're probably just nesting somewhere where we haven't gone to see them. Um, so that they're they're somewhere up in the northeastern U.S. probably, or you know, nesting up there in Canada or northeastern U.S. Um, and I don't think we've actually found a colony of them yet. Um, it was an interesting little side note about Daytona Beach shores. Um, there was a lesser black bat gull that showed up 
for several years in a herring gull colony in I think it was either Canada or United States, but but it, it was banded. I think it was F6 or something like that was its tag number. Uh, I don't remember the number, but um, it bred for several years with herring gulls because you know it didn't have any lesser black guy gulls to breed with. So that happens sometimes with species. Um, they'll breed with the next best thing they can find. And it produced offspring and the offspring were banded and both the adult and I think a couple of different groups of generations of the, the hybrid offspring showed up at Daytona Beach Shores and they were able to identify them by their bands there. So, so we had a little connection between Daytona Beach Shores and the, and the place up there where they were breeding. But um, I, if they haven't found them breeding yet in North America, they probably will eventually, but it's, it's pretty cold and rocky and very different up there than it is going to the beach here in Florida. So. Uh-huh. Uh, Ethan just piped in that the earliest record uh, of breeding was 2007 in New England. Is that North America or? Yeah, New, New England. In New England, okay, okay. Cool, okay, so they have started nesting in. So, okay. Um, so we've got another shot of the, the underbite of the skimmer there, which is kind of interesting to watch. Uh, the, the picture, um, the lower right is our the force I mentioned the Forster's turn earlier. That's very similar to the um, to the Bonaparte's gull, at least in the structure. Um, one of the neat things about Forster's turns, which is the small turn that you see in the winter time here, we don't see the least turns in the winter time. They got that solid black eye patch. They lose their their dark head, which if you see one now, they do have a solid dark head, but now that solid dark eye patch, and generally the rest of the head is white. Um, Another species you might see that's kind of similar to this is the gull billed tern, which has a thicker, more blunt bill and a more blocky looking head. It's not quite as um, slender as, but it's about the same size as, as the Forster's tern, but they don't have the solid black patch. They usually have just a little kind of a little bit of a smudge of black on the head and a mostly white head on them in the wintertime. It's a lot harder to separate them when they all have black caps in the summertime, but we don't see that quite as much. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the other turns, when I was very early on in, in birding, when I first joined Audubon in 84 and found out there were other people that watched birds besides me around here and found out there was a whole lot more birds than I was aware of. I heard the term red is not royal and thankfully we don't hear that that much anymore at least i don't hear it that much anymore but you can see in the two examples you have the royal turn on the left and then the caspian turn highlighted on the right and indeed the caspian does have a red bill here and the royal turn has a yellowish or orangish bill but the royals can sometimes have reddish bills and really there's so many other things that you can separate them by um, to me, the structure is, is the biggest thing. Caspian tern, so we mentioned earlier how Bonaparte's gulls can look very much like a tern. They're so small. The Caspians are so big and bulky, they can look like a, a, a gull from a distance. Generally, you know, terns are very slender and angular and pointed wings, and they're kind of buoyant, and gulls are kind of more just kind of blocky and just kind of fly in a straight line, and, and they're more blunt winged and all that. Well, Caspian terns are kind of blunt and big and chunky and heavy headed and thick build even for a, for a tern. Um, so often with separating Royal and Caspian tern, for me, it, it's from a distance, it's all about that structure that Caspian just has that bulky look. Now it's, it, it's not always easy to tell, you know, sometimes you get more slender Caspian terns or I have occasionally screwed up an identification and then they flew closer and I realized okay that was wrong on that one but the other thing is um, and I've heard it described several different ways but royal terns most of the year have that male pattern baldness look or friar tuck or Danny DeVito or they have that that black wrapping from the eye all around the back of the head and then the forehead is white and kind of salt and pepper on the top there Caspian terns you can see this is kind of a classic winter Caspian turn here it's got that salt and pepper right to the bill there. Um, no white on the forehead. Now some Caspian terns will show a little bit of white right above the bill there and even sometimes halfway up the head. So you will sometimes see white on the head on the Caspian turn, but those marks are a little bit better um, for separating them. And 
another thing that was pointed out to me and I didn't notice it, but I have seen it since then, the underside of the tip of the wing is solid black on the Caspian turn. Um, this royal turn in this case is actually molting, so it doesn't show the pattern quite so well, but there's kind of a, a dark check mark. The, the leading edge and trailing edge of the tip of the wing are, are dark, but it's pale in between. So it kind of forms a little V on the dark V on the tip of the wing. So if you can see that, um, you can use that to separate. But if you can see that, you're probably also going to see a lot of the other characteristics that separate them too. So, so I wouldn't put too much faith in uh, soft part colors in gulls and turns because you get occasional odd variants. And if you look through enough laughing gulls, you find some with orange bills and half red and half black bills and all that. So, so if you find don't don't base your identification of a rare gull or a turn on the on the soft part colors, that being the, the legs and the bill and that, um, because that can that can fool you. That can be an odd variant sometimes. So. Okay. These are a few of the other things we see around the tidal ponds out there. Ruddy turnstones, most of the year, they're in the middle here. They're usually not ruddy until around well, now, if you see them, they will be nice orange color on the head and neck and the back. Most of the time they're kind of, they still have those orange legs. They got that kind of neat little bill, kind of a stout little bill for a, for a shorebird, a sandpiper. Um, they've benefited greatly in Florida from rock jetties because they love to go all over, you know, pick through the, the shells and stuff and the rock jetties um, that we've built all up and down the inlets along the, the coast of Florida. They're a species that's benefited. They probably would be here anyways, but, um, but they definitely um, benefited quite a bit from that. They also will readily take to taking your picnic too. And the dry tortugas, um, they had an issue. They used to, the day trips out there, um, the Yankee Freedom would come out there and bring people out there every day and they would serve lunch in the picnic area. And the park had to tell them to start serving lunch on the boat because the turnstones would come up every day they knew when lunchtime was, so they'd come up and take the chips and the food and everything from the, from the picnic tables there. So they had to, to move the food back onto the boat because these little guys are like little pigeons out there on the dry tortugas out there. Um, um, but you'll see those mostly in coastal areas. Now they do show up occasionally in migration in inland areas. Um, you may see them at Lake Apopka. We see them in Lake Okeechobee in the winter time because Lake Okeechobee serves as kind of a a big inland sea in a way. Um, so you'll see wintering ready turnstones around in places on the on the lake out there. Um, another common coastal species on the right here is the willet. Um, this is probably a western willet. We actually, there's probably two species of willets. Um, they haven't done the work to separate them out yet. Um, but we have the ones that, that nest around here in Florida are the eastern willets that nest in the salt marshes and mangrove in the openings between the mangroves all along the coast from Mexico up around Texas and the Gulf of Mexico and around Florida and all the way up to New Jersey or so. They nest in that coastal area, a little coastal strip. They're a little bit stubbier build. They're much more darkly marked in their breeding plumage, a little shorter legged than the western willets that we see here in the winter time. The western willets actually breed out in the Great Plains um, and migrate down here. This time of year you'll see both because we do get a few western willets to stay all summer out here. Interesting thing about Eastern willets, um, kind of like with our um, with the Bonaparte gulls that we never see in breeding plumage, we never see eastern willets in winter plumage. They molt before they come up here in the springtime and they start showing up around late March or so in the springtime. And then they leave us sometime around July or August and then molt back on the wintering grounds there. So we never see them in their nice gray plumage like this, like this western willet here. But, but you'll see both of them at this time of year and you'll see western willets pretty much year round. Um, if you do get a willet in an inland area, they do show up during migration in places like Lake Apaca or um, other areas in inland areas, you will see um, usually westerns because they're the ones that are coming down from the Great Plains. And, um, the eastern ones, I think pretty much stay close to the coast. Although separating the two is a little bit tricky. Um, and that may be part of the reason why we're reluctant to separate them out as different species, but their breeding ranges are completely disjunct. And, uh, their migratory habits are different and uh, there's some overlap in their non-breeding habitat preferences, but 
I want them to separate them because I want another species on my Florida <laughs> list. So, so do a lot of other people, I imagine. So, as long as I don't get to 499, I don't want my 500th bird to be a, a split. So, but anyways, another bird that we get and again has benefited even more from the um, these rock jetties that we've created all up and down is, is the purple sandpiper, which you see on the left hand side here. They often hang out with the turnstones. Um, bill's a little bit longer. They have a different feeding behavior. They kind of pick around in the, in the vegetation that, that algae and seagrass, sea, seaweeds or whatever that grow on the rocks out there. Um, we get them in Florida as far south as um, Ponce Inlet in Volusia County on a regular basis. And then south of that, they occur occasionally. Uh, Sebastian Inlet probably gets one about every three to five years. Um, south of that, they become much more scarce. Now, a couple of winters ago, they were all down the whole East Coast, all the way down to the Keys. Uh, I didn't get down there to get them for my Monroe County list, but um, that's a whole other subject again, the county listing, but I don't wanna get down in that rabbit hole too far, but I'm pushing 300 in Monroe County and I don't have the purple sandpiper, which was down there wintering a couple of years ago, but. Anyways, um, can't be everywhere at once, I guess. So. Um, so yeah, so we do get purple sandpipers when they're out there. They're they're pretty reliable. They pretty much stay on the rocks for the most part. And there's a little flat rock over by that. I mentioned the tidal pond on the north side of, of the inlet. There, there was a, a little flat rock on the rock jetty there that the purple sandpipers would go to during high tide when all their algae was covered up by the water. So if you wanted to get them, just go there at high tide, you could go find them sitting on that rock out there. And there was two of them last time they were there. Sometimes we get one, most times we get zero, but um, when we get them, there'll be usually one or two around out there. So that was kind of fun um, to be able to go out and see them and photograph them. Um, if you want to get them on, you know, reliably, um, Lighthouse Point Park on the north side of Ponce Inlet is probably your best bet to get them out there. And I've actually missed them several times there because there's so much habitat for them there. And it's not easy to see all of it. Um, I've actually missed them a few times there. Last time I was there, I got video of them and all kinds of neat stuff. So um, so it, it's, it's, it's a neat place to go, but, but it's not in New River County. So we won't talk too much about it. So okay, move on to this one. So, um, we get some of the egrets around there. Get a lot of herons and egrets in that area. We, um, black crown night herons actually roost near that tidal pond. There's a little kind of hidden mangrove pond back in there right next to the parking lot. And the black crown night herons will roost in there. Um, we don't encourage people to go in there and try and see them while they're in there. But if you do want to see them, if you come in really early in the morning, like before light, or go out there and at dusk, they'll come into that tidal pond, in or out, in what direction they're going. In the evening, they'll come out and they'll kind of hang around and have their morning coffee or evening coffee, I guess, if you're a night heron, and hang out for a little bit before going out to forage for the night. In the mornings, they'll come back in. They, they may or may not stop in the pond. They may just fly straight back to the mangroves, depending on you know whether they've been out all night or if they're tired or whatever. So. So you do have opportunity to see the black crown night herons out there and they may stay and feed all night out there. The Sebastian Inlet State Park is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week because it's there's a lot of fishermen that come in there and, and um, so it, it's open all the time. So you can go there in the middle of the night if you want to and, and go see what's hanging out in the tidal pond out there. And got a nice little snowy egret on the left hand side out here. This one looks like a younger one, actually, I think, with the yellow running up the back of its legs there. No plumes on it, so it's probably a youngster. Um, we'll see quite a few of those. Um, separating those from little blue heron, immature little blue herons can be somewhat challenging. Um, I, I often do it by structure, but the structural differences are very subtle between these two. Um, a good way to separate them Little blue herons have the same green, greenish legs and the bluish green base of the bill and dark tip of the bill that they do as adults, even when they're in their white immature plumage. So if you look for that pattern on it, now uh, there's subtle, there's differences in their habitat preferences. Little blue herons like floating vegetation. They often feed on hyacinths and stuff like that. A little bit more prone to being in fresh water, although they will use salt water as well. Um, and so it's, it's, if you get a mixed flock of egrets, it's fun to, to look 
look beyond the field marks and look at the structural differences because that can tell you a lot about especially separating out little blue and snowy egret little blue is just chunkier thicker shorter bill thicker neck um, a little bit more elongated head um, maybe thicker legs too i don't know about that but it's definitely there, there is a difference in the structure between the two and it's fun to study stuff like that anyways it might take you a while to, to pick up on it but it is something worth worth studying um, there's so many different aspects of birding you can enjoy um, if i live long enough i'll enjoy all of them but i'm, I'm working on it but um, so next yeah this is another one that we, i like to call this a whitish egret this is the reddish egret which most of the time are, are, you know, bluish color with a reddish head and neck. And then they have a bicolored bill similar to a little blue heron. Um, they're a little bit bigger than the other medium sized herons, but smaller than great egrets. They got a kind of a big, heavy bill on them, big, long legs. Um, they come in two different color morphs. The color morphs are not any more significant than red or, you know, blue eyes or brown eyes. They're just, uh, it's just, I think, a single pair of genes that separate that determines whether they're white or they're dark. You don't really see, I've seen, I think, one or two individuals that might have been intermediate morphs between the dark and the light. And I've seen dark birds that had a few white feathers, but that's just loose, loosism or leukism, um, or a few feathers happen to be white. Um, but red secret is pretty much a coastal species. They're, they do occasionally show up in inland areas in fresh water, but they're most pretty strictly coastal. So you got to come out to uh, Black Point Wildlife Drive at Meridale, the National Wildlife Refuge is a good place to see them. Sebastian Inlet can be good at times. Sometimes they're there. This last winter, I don't remember seeing very many of them out there, but, um, but they're often in those coastal saltwater areas. And they're known for dancing around um, quite a bit. They, they expend a lot of energy to catch little tiny fish. Um, you see them flying around and dancing and running and spreading their wings out and they catch a little fish and then they sit there. So apparently they're very, very efficient at getting every little bit of energy out of those fish that they can. So, because um, they're still here, they're not dying. So they're, they're doing something right. So, um, okay. The other thing we like we see out there, Sebastian Inlet is a coastal site. It can be quite good for, for migrating songbirds out there or vagrants at times. So um, at this time of year in the springtime, we, we get a lot of um, birds that migrate from the Caribbean offshore on the east coast of Florida. And um, they fly at night and then they come um, come off this, the ocean and, and around dawn or so you'll see a lot of them coming in sh um, coming ashore and they come into Sebastian Inlet on the south side and hang out in the campground area down there because there's a lot of, um, a lot of good food for them there and it beats trying to swim out in the ocean so they come in and land there sometimes they fly right over we've had days where there's been hundreds and hundreds of migrants just flying right over top of us there um, we've had Connecticut warblers, which should be coming in pretty soon now. We had a big nails, had two big nails thrushes, I think, there one time. They were singing and calling in there. Um, we've had Kirtland's warbler three times at Sebastian Inlet now. Um, the bird on the left here is a white crowned pigeon, which has been showing up um, more and more frequently uh, further north. That's a Caribbean species, mostly seen down in southeast Florida and to some extent in southwest Florida. Um, one showed up in South Brevard County recently. There was one in St. Lucie County a while back. They've had them up as far north as Pinellas and Volusia counties um, in the past. This one was down at Sebastian Inlet. Somebody had told us about it. Um, and we went down there, and went into the campground and went next to the campground host site, which is one of the great, great little birding spots for, for um, migrants in there. And, and, and Dee actually found it before I did. Um, it was sitting just practically ground level down there it was a young bird and uh, it's got a little bit of white in the crown you can see it there but but it's a caribbean species mostly eats berries and something that you occasionally get in these areas like this. i still don't have it for brevard county which kind of annoys me when i get a bird in any river county i don't have a brevard county i've got like six now i think that i've gotten down there and it's really annoying at sebastian inlet because sebastian inlet is in both indian river and brevard counties and I now have Kirtland's warbler and white crown pigeon 
and Big Nails Thrush on the Indian River sound, side of Sebastian Inlet, but never on the other side of the inlet. But that's part of the problem of being a county lister, I guess. Uh, but anyways, um, so yeah, but the red starts are one of the things that are coming through. We've heard a few reports of red starts and black poles coming through. Those are fairly late migrants. A lot of our migrants have already moved through. Things like uh, hooded warblers, Louisiana water thrush, worm eating warblers, those kind of things will move through often in March and April. Later in the season like this, we'll get some of the more northerly breeders, um, things like Cape May warblers that are breeding up in the boreal forest, red starts and black pole warblers. Red starts breed in very broad breeding range from southeastern U.S. all the way up to Alaska. And black poles breed all the way up in the uh, boreal forest. So they're waiting for it to get warmer up there. So they tend to come through a little bit later. So we'll see flights. Um, if you get out on a day when there's a good southeast wind blowing and there's a good flight of birds, if you go out to the Sebastian Inlet or any coastal location, right at dawn, you'll sometimes see flocks of the, uh, red starts and black poles coming in. And you'll see a wave come in and you'll see a bunch more come in. And you'll see others, black three blues will be in there with them. And, Cape May warblers and black and white warblers, a lot of those Caribbean type migrants will come in there some days, not always, but um, and red black poles and red starts will keep streaming through sometimes into early June some years, but not too many by that point. When I worked at Fort Pearson at State Park, I would see, I, I was picking up trash and telling people to put their dogs back on the leash and all the kind of fun stuff you get to do as a park ranger at Fort Pearson, but, but I'd also occasionally see birds come flying in off the ocean and even as late as two or three in the afternoon some of those birds would keep flying until eventually they just finally had to take a rest and they come flying in so it's kind of a neat thing that you'll see at this time of year at the beach um the beach has always mostly interested me in, as far as what kind of birds we have oh, yeah oh we're still on the first site and we're yeah. <laughs> 15 minutes away from the end so did i tell you i'd like to talk a lot but um yeah so anyway so okay so we'll move on to we want to get a couple more shots just yeah. one last yeah, thing about the inlet yeah, this is part of the reason you see a lot of these privets out here at the inlet. Um, uh, this is a real, this you can plant this in your yard, actually, Florida privet. It's a great native plant. It attracts um, insects and has great food for the birds, particularly migrants like that. It's also ficus and other things out there that we see um, in that area. So find the fruits and you'll find the birds out there. So and there's a lot of this in the campground area. So there'll be some in our yard someday when we eventually get around to planting it. But okay. So right across the river, St. Sebastian River Preserve State Park, a place I know really well because I worked there for 12 years in the early stages. It's 22,000 acres, basically a lot of pine flatwoods and associated ecosystems with that. Scrubby flatwood scrub, nice swamps and wetland areas that borders the uh, Sebastian River, which is a major stopover for, uh, for manatees, which is part of the reason for setting it up. But it also has, we we'll to the next one, also has scrub jays, red cockaded woodpeckers, and a lot of the species that are associated. Both of these are considered to be kind of keystone species, or if you manage the habitat for these two species on your property, a lot of other species are gonna come along with them. Um, so you manage the scrub really well, you're gonna have all sorts of plants and insects and other um, birds that, that will survive in that same habitat. Red cockaded woodpeckers, they've done a lot of really good management, uh, restoration of the pinelands out there at St. Sebastian River Preserve. They've opened it up. It's more of a uh, pine savanna type of ecosystem with pine trees and mostly grass and reduced the palmetto down to more like what it probably used to be. And it kept it burned really well. And the red cockaded, there's, there's almost they almost are at carrying capacity in red cockaded woodpeckers. They have been bringing in red cockaded woodpeckers into the area um, as a habitat or as a management practice to, to um, enhance the population there, but they're getting to the point where they almost can't bring in anymore. So, uh, but red cockaded, it looks kind of like a harrier downy woodpecker, but you notice has a big white cheek patch, doesn't have that black patch on the cheek like a um, downy and hairy does, and, and the back is laddered. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, we do have one. Yeah, you can see the downy woodpecker on this one here has the, the patch on the side. And downy and hairy woodpecker are pretty similar in plumage. Um, they both have a white stripe on the back, but then the, um, if you see one from behind, there's a little black stripe right on the, 
right between the, the red on it's a solid red on this is on the males the females don't have that but uh, on the hairy and downy woodpecker hairy and downy are another ones that the voices are quite a bit different and the structure is different look how tiny this little bill is on a downy woodpecker it's like maybe half the depth of the head here maybe if that much maybe actually it's about a quarter i guess and um, hairy woodpecker has a much more stout bill, much closer to the, the depth, the length of the bill versus the depth of the head is, is closer to equal. Um, hairy woodpecker is, is much less common in Florida. They're often found around areas where if they've been burned frequently, they like recently burned dead trees. So if there's a wildfire, hairy woodpeckers might move into it, but they're, they're a bit of a specialist. And we have, there are a number of them at St. Sebastian River Preserve actually out there along with the red cockades and the downies and the pileatids and the red bellies and sap suckers. And we have a fair amount of flickers out there too, particularly down in the scrub section where we do our scrub jay work. Um, flickers have dropped off a lot in the last 30 years. So they used to be a lot more common when I was a kid, but certain areas have, have them out there. And so they're, they're kind of a fun bird to, to see now because I remember as a kid, it was no big deal to see them. Now it's like, you know, oh, look, there's a flicker. That's a pretty good bird, you know? So we got a pretty good location here. And some of the other things out there, there's a lot of towies out in scrub out there in particular. This one's the female, the male has the black on the head. Um, it used to be rufous sided towie, if you remember back in the old days when they um, spotted an Eastern and, and I think black back, there's another towie down in Mexico that were all split out from the rufous sided towie a while back. Um, so the spotted has more spots on the back. It doesn't have the white patch on the wing that the Eastern towies have, and the towies do that interesting little two foot scratch that they do. So it's something you actually identify them by sound as they're scratching in the leaf litter there. The other interesting bird that we have a lot of out there, so many they're giving them away, in fact, is the brown-headed nuthatches, which is our southeastern pineland nuthatch, um, which has declined in a lot of areas. The St. Sebastian has a bunch, and, and now um, Jonathan Dickinson State Park has a few that were donated from St. Sebastian from their excess population there. So they've reestablished them as a breeder down at uh, Jonathan Dickinson State Park where they've also done quite a bit of habitat enhancement down there. And I think they've, re they've reintroduced red cockaded woodpeckers down there too. I'm not sure what the status of that project actually is now, but so next. So in other words, we get a lot of brown thrashers out there too, which now brown thrashers are a little bit easier to see because they're out singing right now. Kind of a big brown mockingbird with a streaky chest. And they often sit up at the top of a tree, but not quite the top, but they're still up there where you can see them. And, um, they do, they sound a bit like a mockingbird, but they'll do two phrases and stop, and two phrases and stop. And in the middle of the song, they might do three phrases in, in a row and then stop. Mockingbirds do a dead-on impression of brown thrasher phrases, but they don't get the cadence right. They'll do four or five phrases in a row and go right into the next phrases. So if you were to separate out that individual phrase that the Mockingbird did, it'd be a perfect rendition, but the song is completely off. Um, well, the cadence is completely off. So, And the Bob Whites, that's a species that has dropped a lot and has reduced the numbers quite a bit. But St. Sebastian River Preserve, due to the habitat management, prior to state ownership and during state ownership, there's still quite a few Bob Whites out there. So, um, so that, that's a fun bird. I used to see them in the backyard growing up in Cocoa and now they're no longer anywhere near that neighborhood. So, um, so in some areas they've held on and even increased in numbers. So quail have some next. So. And we see eagles out there. The eagle population is increasing out there as in a lot of places. Um, there's, we both, D and I both do eagle watches out there on some of the nests out there. I haven't hardly did mine this year at all because I was so busy, but um, but several pairs will nest out there. These are a couple of juveniles here. One of them starting to molt already. Um, as juveniles, they have longer feathers on the wings. The primary and secondaries are longer. And then when they molt into subsequent plumages, the newer feathers are shorter, but they'll retain several of the juvenile feathers. So in their second year, there'll be a raggedy edge to the trailing edge of the wing because they have that mix of juvenile feathers and, and older feathers, which are shorter. Um, and that's actually seen in several gulls are the same way, I believe, and, and other things too. So, or, or much more. okay. Well, we'll talk a little bit about Pelican Island, but we're gonna run out of time here pretty quick. But Pelican Island, if you're in the area, is, is definitely, it's our first national wildlife refuge. Um, Joe's Overlook 
is a great place to walk out to. Um, we actually had seaside sparrows and shark or Nelson sparrows recently out there this year. Um, and it's a great place for shorebirds. It's just south of Sebastian Inlet, so you can visit it around the same time. You get some of the same kind of vagrant songbirds out there and shorebirds, get some more ducks out there. They created some nice duck, some wetland habitat out there recently and there. So got a lot of great history. We do a whole program on that one as well. So, and we've had some rarities out there, including the northernmost Western Spindalis was seen out there a few years back on Jungle Trail, which runs through the refuge out there. Um, and this was, uh, Indian River County's first American golden plover which showed up at Joe's Overlook um, wasn't found by me it was found by Will Johnson who's our local young birding phenom who's gone off to college now but, um, but a bunch of us got to see it and I actually got to see it leave one day because I had been out there seeing it it kept, kept going in and out of the mangroves and then it flew over Centennial Pond after I told some people oh if you go out there if you look for it it'll eventually show up and then uh, 10 minutes after they walked off, it flew over Centennial Pond and, and was never seen again. So I was like, oh, guess you missed it by 10 minutes. We've all done that. But um, is this it? For, um, and, just, and then there's yeah. other things out there. You can see the killdeer, the blue jays. Um, we see a few things we see less of, but we don't see flickers or common grackles and things like that in that barrier island. So it's kind of interesting how the barrier island will be missing some of the species that are on the mainland out there. So you don't see a lot of blackbirds or crackles or red-shouldered hawks are much more, um, more um, localized on the barrier island out there. So, um, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, and you do get some interesting um, butterflies and stuff out there. The coral beans are great for the hummingbirds. And when they're flowering, they're a little, a little bit past their flowering right now. I think it's more like March and April. Um, and see the Phaeon Crescent, which I'm not quite as familiar with, is out there, one of the butterflies. If you go back into the trails out there, you see mangrove buckeyes as opposed to the common buckeyes we see on the mainland. And the mangrove buckeyes have a little rusty patch on the wing instead of the white patch on the, on the wings. So, and they're all over the place back in the mangrove trails out there, along with warblers. Who knows what else you might see out there? So, is that one the last one? There? And then just good oh, one. And good one, yeah. TM Goodman Wildlife Management Area is known for its spoonbill nesting out at the beginning there. And um, we also get a lot of waterfowl. Dude. Um, it's a great place to watch the spoonbills nest. They'll actually come right up on the parking lot on the shore there and gather nesting material. And when they fledge their young, the young will often come right over to the parking area. So you can stand there right at the edge and look right down at them, watch them feeding the babies. And on Thursdays, you can drive all the way to the back out there, and I've had some amazing days for birds out there. Just tremendous. It's like a zoo out there. It's a, it's a lot like Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive. Um, driving out there and back is almost as long as going through Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive, but you get um, a nice mix of species out there. And you never know what you can see. I regularly get 70 plus species out there, including the swamp ants. There's a lot of swamp ants out there. Sometimes a lot of black billy whistling ducks. Um, Fulvus has become less common recently out there, but, uh, but the gray-headed swamp in, as we have to start calling them now, um, there are, it's not unusual to get 50 of them out there at TM Goodwin. And, and we do see the snail, snail kites come and go a lot out there. They did come back and breed again this spring out there, but they were gone for months. So, so they're very nomadic. Um, but it, it can be a good place to see them if they're being seen out there. They'll nest right near the parking lot at the beginning there, or they'll just disappear for months at a time, which they've done several times recently. So, um, these are some of the other breeding birds to get around that nesting colony out there. Um, spoonbills, great egrets, and hingas, and snowy egrets tend to be the staples. Some years we've had glossy and white ibis in there. Sometimes we've got little blue herons, tricolored herons. Great blue herons usually don't nest with them. They like to be nearby, but not with the other herons. Here. It's a little bit antisocial, but but you know, from year to year it varies quite a bit. It seems like. So. And of course, limp. There's a lot of limpkins around out there too, and you'll see their the shells from what they've been eating all around the base of the um, the parking lot out there as well. So. And black neck still to be out there, so I think that's it. Isn't it? Oh, and then, and tree swallows and red shouldered hawks. Red shouldered hawks divide the parking lot up into two different territories out there. So you'll see one pair nesting to the south and the other pair to the north there. 
and swallows come through that you're in the St. John's River Valley. So the swallow migration is pretty amazing at times out there. You get thousands of them moving through out there. Barns, trees, uh, barn swallows nest there as well as migrate through. So. I think that's the last one. There we go. <laughs> All right, questions in the last three minutes, Sarah. Uh, I'll stop sharing so we can actually take a look at the chat so we've got any okay. other questions. Okay, and I'll just tell you, ask you, um, how about the stick marsh? Can you stick marsh? Well, what people refer to as stick marsh is actually more probably Goodwin or the, the parking lot there where um, the stick marsh itself is a big three mile by one mile pool of water that doesn't have a lot of birds on it anymore. Um, but that was the first thing out there. So it's kind of like why we call convenience store 7-Elevens because that was the first convenience store. Or we call bandages band-aids because that's what everybody talked about. Oh, oh, somebody's been there. So, okay, you gotta get with me if you wanna see red cockades at St. Sebastian. So um, I can- For Brennan? Yeah. No. Also, he wanted to know about Mississippi kites and where they're most prevalent. Locally, probably Lake Apaka Wildlife Drive, but they're, you, if you get up to Gainesville, they're all over the place up there. South of Gainesville, they're a lot more sporadic. Um, there are, you can check eBird for spotting for sightings of them. They're starting to breed in Lake County, Pinellas County, and other places like that. But I think probably locally to, to Orange County, at least. Um, I don't know if they're coming if they're back again this year out there, but I know I have seen them out um, around where the sod farms are towards the end of the wildlife drive in the past out there. So. But yeah. if you really want to get them, go to Gainesville. They're, they're like everywhere up in that area. Um, and they should be back by now. It's usually late April when I think that they start to come back in that area. So. And Ethan also asked about when are Connecticut warblers most prevalent? Right about now. It's about the second week of, of May is the, the peak time for them. So in the next week or two is when they're going to be coming through. Um, I you might be better off in coastal areas um, if you check the um, the campground on the south side of Sebastian Inlet is a good place for them. I've also had them at um, well, I'm at Fort Pierce Inlet State Park. I've had them at um, Captain Forrester's Hammock, which is down south of Pelican Island and south of 510 in Indian River County. It's a great little migrant spot. At times, it can be great for them, um, but they tend to be skulkers down on the ground level, down in the grass and stuff like that. Often when I've seen them, I've flushed them up out of the grass actually, as opposed to seeing them initially. So, um, but yeah, this next week, this is the time to look for them. And, and coastal areas are probably your best bet, but you know, mead gardens could get them just as well out there. Look for them in like down in the ferns and then the ground cover and places like that, kind of thick places in there, so. Very cool. Any other questions? overwhelm you with too much information. <laughs> yeah, that is excellent. Yeah, very informative. Wow. Thank you so much. Yeah, lot to touch us. Good. Yeah. Well, it's recorded, so you can go back and watch it over <laughs> and over and over again, <laughs> try to figure it all out. So. Oh, Nikki, Nikki want to know about the stick uh, marsh in Blue Cypress Lake. Um, Blue Cypress Lake is, is best accessed from um, Highway 60 out west of Euro Beach. Um, and Stick Marsh actually is right next to it as the crow flies, but you can't really get from one to the other very well. Um, the, um, the, the southwest corner of Stick Marsh actually is right up against the Blue Cypress Lake area. Blue Cypress Lake is, is really good for um, well, for vultures and short-tailed hawks, if you can get out on the lake, it's a fantastic place for nesting ospreys. Um, the Indian River, uh, Indian Island River, um, Pelican Island Audubon documented over 300 nests of ospreys on Blue Cypress Lake, which is a big lake. Um, and they're feeding on the lake as well as stick marsh nearby and the new stick marsh next to it. Um, what I call new stick marsh, Felsmer Headwaters uh, area, which is next to stick marsh and um, is a much better birding area than stick marsh is. Um, so what we refer to as stick marsh parking lot, a lot of times is actually the Felsmere Grade Recreation Area, which you can walk south of there along the edge of stick marsh, or you can go north up into TM Goodwin Wildlife Management Area from there, or you can just bird the parking lot. The parking lot is actually pretty fantastic sometimes too. That's where the spoonbills nest. You often get snail kites right there. 
I did a big sit back in October, right next to the parking lot, had 73 species in six and a half hours out there, I think. And about 73 million mosquitoes out there in the first half hour that I was there too. So um, it can be quite buggy, but it's quite good for birds as well, so. Okay, we got a lot of thank yous. Okay, well, good. Glad to do it. Obviously, I like to talk about birds, so yeah. And if you guys, if anybody has questions or whatever, or I field a lot of bird identification, people send me texts and stuff. I got a really cool one recently. Somebody had video of a nighttime flight of red-necked phalaropes offshore out here off of Brevard County. They had a picture of one in their hand. I don't know how they got it. Um, I've never seen somebody with a red a red egg fowler in their hand before. They had a great little picture of it, but they had video of them just flying over the boat at, at 20 miles offshore. It was a really amazing phenomenon. So, you know, you get to see really cool stuff like that when people send you. So if you've got really neat stuff, you don't know what a bird is or, you know, send me a picture of it. You know, I'll okay, try and David, it what's your email? I'll write it uh, in. SimpsonDavid at Mac.com. Okay easy and the phone number to text or call is 321-720-5516 um, either way works um, and you can go to the website birdingwithdavidsimpson.com and, and hire him as a guide yeah mm -hmm. i can take you out to see red cocky and woodpeckers i do that quite a bit um, or i'll tell you all about i can show you not just describe the birds and habitats i can take you out and show you I just put that all in the chat for you. Yeah, you it's in the it chat. There. Yeah, so if you guys can, you can pull that stuff off the chat if you want to. Um, but yeah, as you can see, I like to talk about birds, natural history, and all sorts of things in Florida. And I've been all over the state. Um, I've seen 150 species of birds in every county in the state. In the process of doing that, I learned a lot about the diversity of habitats and around the state and management areas and, and, it's, and learned a lot, met a lot of people, learned a lot about a lot of different things and read up a lot. So it's, it's, it's fun. It's a really fun state Florida is. For a state without mountains, it's really quite amazingly diverse. Um, so. All right, we'll let everyone go. Thanks again, David and Dee. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks David and Dee. Bye. Bye.